Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. What's another name? What's another thing that we could substitute for Pentecost? Harvest. It was the feast of the harvest. Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, was for, say together, harvest. Some of the charismania, charismatics get too caught up in the giftings. And boy, they sure like to make a show of them sometimes, don't they? But that's not what they were for. <laughs> the giftings were so that Jesus Christ would be exalted and lifted up and magnified and that men and women and children, they would be drawn to him because of what they experienced. We're going to talk about one of those giftings that happened in the early church just right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit tonight. And you'll find it in Acts chapter 3. We'll start with uh, verse 1 if you have your Bibles. Acts chapter 3. Father, I just ask that your spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth this evening as we delve into your word and that we look at some things which you have for us. Help us to gain understanding and to gain knowledge and wisdom in these things so that we know how to use these gifts properly for the benefit of your kingdom of which we are a part. For that grand and glorious day when we will all be united together in your presence. So help us, Lord. Help me, Father, to portray your word as you want it to be portrayed in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame, from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wonderful miracle of God. There's many things that we can learn from this short little passage of Scripture tonight. Things that still resonate today or should resonate in the house of God and with God's people, but so many look back to the book of Acts as the history book, which it is, of the foundation of the church through the giving of the Holy Spirit, the giftings. The church had already been established with the Holy Spirit and the giftings and the power that was needed for the church to function were not in operation until he came down when Jesus sent the Comforter down. And it's easy for modern church to look back and say, wow, that was really fantastic. The power that they had back then. Well, isn't that sad? Shouldn't people be saying, wow, isn't it great the power that we have today, 2,000 years later in the house of God in the church, 
Because the Holy Spirit has never changed. The Holy Spirit has continued to teach people for centuries about Jesus and about the power that's available to them. And time over time throughout history, we see swells of when men have taken notice of the Holy Spirit and some call them revivals and some call them renewings and refreshings. But the honest truth is that the Holy Spirit is not looking for a time period to do things. He's looking for a people to do things through. If it's a time period, then what about all the people that are in between this time and that time? What about them? That's not the way that God operates. Unfortunately, it's the way that people operate. And I hear it, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times in my Christian life. Oh, I'm just waiting for God's Spirit to pour out again, like it did in the day of Pentecost, or like it did at Azusa Street in the early 1900s. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And that's what God is saying. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, will you just ask me? Why don't we ask? Fear? Unbelief? Don't think he does that anymore? All God looks for. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why are few chosen? What that phrase means is that he would that everybody that becomes a believer becomes a mighty witness for him. You're chosen to do that. Amen? If you're a believer, you're chosen to tell others of Christ and to help lead them and bring them into the kingdom. And along with that, he supplies the power. Whatever it is for your task, whatever field you're working in, he gives you the proper combine. If you're working in a Field with a lot of ears of corn. I don't know who those people are, but he gives you a combine that's got a head on it. That's what they call the thing on the front of the combine. He gives you a combine with a head on it that is set up to harvest corn. If you're working in a wheat field, then he gives you a combine with a head on it that's set up to harvest wheat. Any crop that you want to name. Well, we know that there are different fields out there and that we all have certain specific fields that we're more acclimated towards and that God calls us to. It's very simple to figure that out. If you're a person that works in a particular line of work, you can't really relate to the person that's a nuclear physicist over here very well, can you? That's not your field, more than likely. Your field is probably where you work at, or the people that you hang out with, or your neighborhood. So we have to be smart. We have to be wise in the field that the Lord has for us, because he said that the fields are white. They are ripe unto harvest. Whatever field, beloved one, that you are in, i got to tell you that there is harvest all around you. Don't go looking over into someone else's field and say, boy, they really need to get busy over there. No, I really need to get busy in my field. I need to ask the Holy Spirit to help me in the field that I've been given. Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Well, the hour of prayer then is, it is now, was morning, noon, and night. To them, that was the morning hour was 9, the noon hour was 12, and the hour of prayer, the evening hour, was the ninth hour, hour 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man laid from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Horaios is the Greek name for that word beautiful that we have translated. But horaios means something more than just something nice to look at. Yes, I'm sure it was a very beautiful gate. It probably had 
just beautiful foundational flowers and vines and gold perhaps, pearls, per who knows what all it had. It was called beautiful, but listen. Heraios also means belonging to the right hour or season. You see, it was the right hour. It was the ninth hour. It was the right season. The Holy Spirit had just been given. And they were at the right place. For a man that had been lame since birth, never knew what it was like to stand up and to walk and to leap. As a little boy growing up, all he could do was watch his friends run and skip and play and do things. And there he sat. Oh, that I could just do what they do. But since I can't, I'm going to live the life of a beggar and I'm going to have to ask people to help me. There's nothing wrong with asking people to help you. If you're in the house of God, it should be a natural thing. David wrote, I have never seen the righteous forsaken by God, nor begging for bread. You see, if you're in the house of God, you should never go hungry. You have brothers and sisters. How many of you would let your brother or your sister go hungry if they needed some bread? I don't think anybody in here. You would want to help them, wouldn't you? Same with the house of God. We all become brothers and sisters in Christ when we receive salvation. And so, the gate beautiful. It was the right hour, the right season for Peter and John to do what the Lord had asked them to do. He saw Peter and John about to go in and he asked them for money. He was like, could you help out a guy? I, I just need some help. This is the only form of income I have. I don't know what a person that was disabled in that time period did. I would assume that most of them quite frankly, died. In our day and age, we have all of these organizations. We have organizations to help you if you have this disability or that disability or this problem. We have all of that in place. And thank God for our nation's compassion for people like that. And we do this all around the world. And thank God for that. But you see, back then, the temple, the house of God was the place that you went hoping that there would be somebody there that would have compassion on you and, and help you out, help a brother out. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him, and so did John, and said, look on us. Now, I heard uh, someone say this last week, and it reminded me of our experiences but when somebody is in need and you're out in the public and you don't really have the time or you know that you can't supply it, you don't look upon them, do you? You look the other way because if you look and they lock eyes with you, it's all over. Because they're going to say, hey, come here. And then what are you going to be? You're going to be cruel and like, yeah. You're going to go over and you know, you know the gig is up then. It's like, okay, I'm going to have to listen then. Well, that's what, the, that's what was going on here. And I've told this before, but my wife, she has me walk on the side in the malls where the, all of the sales booths are, and she walks on the outer side because she has this tendency to lock eyes with the people in the kiosk. And it might take us half a day to get through the mall. Because... And some money, too. And some money. Because the first thing you know, she's getting a cream here and a rub there and some eye makeup. and some, So I get on the side where the people are and I have that stern look and that, that steadfast look that we're going to make it to the end to the store that we intended to go to. And we're not going to stop ten times before we get there. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Isaiah, by the way, Isaiah just got another one of those coupons that you go to the car dealership and he scratched it off and he said, you want to go get, we tried that 
and she wouldn't even get out of the car. She sent us in a couple weeks ago. Well, we got another one. So I said, well, you, you have to go in this time because I'm not spending my time down there. I don't want another car. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny when we got in there. Isaiah did win a two dollar bill. But the thing said I would win a thousand dollars. But we all know that's not true. <laughs> How many of y'all know if it says you won a thousand dollars, you're not getting a thousand dollars? Yeah. Okay, good. You're all smart. <laughs> Isaiah had to learn, but he was happy with his two dollar bill and with an ice cream treat afterwards, right? <laughs> so, all right. Well, Peter and John fastened their eyes upon this guy. Said, look on us. And of course, you know, somebody in that condition is like, oh, they must have something really good for me. They told me to look at them. Most people just look the other way. Don't even pay attention. Kind of like when Jesus said, who is your neighbor? The, the man asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Give all you have and give to the poor. Who's my neighbor? Remember the story of the man who fell in the ditch, who the robbers got a hold of him? And all of the priests and the clergy, they walked by. And matter of fact, I'm sure they went to the other side of the street of that byway and they, they turned their heads and they plugged their ears when they heard his groaning and moaning. And they drowned it out with their singing. You know, the Israelites, they sang everywhere they went, right? Which is why you should be singers. You should be singers if you're a believer. Everywhere you go, there should be a song in your heart. Because that's God's way. That's why God's children are happy and they sing. Keep on singing. Don't, I hope you just don't sing here. Let me do that. You gotta sing wherever you're at. Sing. Sing in your car. Sing in your house. They might do your neighbors some good. Or they might shut their windows. But in any case, see, I often think sometimes what our neighbor thinks, every once in a while I'll get out my shofar and blow it. And I'll sing out in the yard. Our neighbor who lives uh, next door loves to get on his riding board. I don't think he even realizes it. But up and down his yard, he's mowing and he's singing. And we can hear him. We can't make out the words. But Kelly says, I like that. Every time he's out mowing, he's just riding around singing a song. Like, we're going to get him into church. Yeah. See, <laughs> see, see if you know some of these songs. Well, Peter said something that might be similar to what you and I might say. Like, you need a $50,000 operation. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have that kind of money. You know, I, I, got, I got 20 bucks on me. I don't know. Will that help you? be willing to help you out. But what you really need, I, I don't have the ability to provide it, and that's what's going on here. Silver and gold, the kind of help that you need for you to be able to sustain a life, being a beggar, and to go from that to being in a home and to have everything taken care of for the rest of your life, I, I just don't have that kind of money. But I'll tell you what, I do have Yesterday, or oh, whatever day it was before, I was in an upper room with 120 other guys, plus my disciple friends. And as we were in there, the Holy Spirit of God came down in a mighty rushing wind with tongues of fire, and the power of God shook that room. And you've probably heard when we came out, and we've been out here in the temple ever since, praising God vociferously, loudly, with great excitement in our voices. And we've been proclaiming, and 3,000 plus people have become born again believers. You might have heard of all of that sitting here as people were going in and out. Well, that's us. And no, we don't have a lot of money. One time when we were with Jesus, we had to pay our taxes just like everybody else. And you know what? We didn't have any money. And you know what he told us to do? He told us to go fish. 
And so we did, because we always did what he said. And when we pulled in the fish, guess what was inside that fish? A big old gold coin. And it was enough to pay our taxes. Hallelujah. But we don't have that gold anymore. We gave it to the government. But what we do have is this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up! Rise up! And walk! And I'm sure he said, I've never ever heard that before. Well, I'm telling you to rise up and walk. How? Here, let me grab a hold of you. The Bible says he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And what happened? He let go and he fell back down. No? He immediately became strengthened. His feet and ankle bones received strength, is what the Bible says. What just happened? We know that the power of the Holy Spirit was in those men, Peter and John. And if God gave them something to do, he gave them a little harvest right there at the Gate Beautiful for such a time as this. But what happened was an exercise in faith. And I've taught on this before, but in the Bible there are a couple of specific words for faith. One is pistos. And depending upon the content, it's usually a noun, but it can also be an action word. But it especially pertains to Christ and reliance upon Him. The woman with the issue of blood, she had that kind of faith. And she reached out. In faith, Believing that if she just touched his garment, somehow, some way, she could be made whole. That's good faith there. But the problem with people who say they have faith is this. Is that most never go to the next phase of faith, which is just you all which is a verb, which means to have faith in and upon a person or a thing and to commit to trust, to put trust with, especially with one's spiritual well-being. What that means is to have faith and to never act with it means that your faith is never going to do anything. I have faith in Jesus. That's good. I have faith in Jesus. I believe he died on Calvary for my sins. And that because of that faith, that I am now a believer. But what happens when that kind of faith is never ever acted upon? What if you never confess with your mouth? Confess with your mouth doesn't mean that you just say, I believe in Jesus. Do you? Confess with your mouth means in the public arena and around those that you know, you say, I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. And let me tell you about Him. I've put my faith in the action of Pistis faith means to absolutely, with no doubt, zero doubt, believe. But pisteo, pisteo, means believe with zero doubt and then to act upon it. This is what the disciples just did. You see, he said, I don't have silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, I command you to take up, rise up, 
and walk. But he didn't stop there. Then he put that faith to action. And he reached down. And he grabbed with his hand. He said, you want to see something? You want to see faith in action? And he started pulling him. And I have to think at first, that guy was like, what's, what's going on here? He's pulling on me. Just like the people do when they come and they carry me here and home every day. But he's pulling on me and I'm coming up. And up and up and now. I'm on my feet. Glory to God, what is this? And his ankle bones are strong now. Oh, Lord God. And he walked with them into the temple. <laughs> Walking and leaping and praising God in verse 8, it says. You see, to put your faith to action is the part where most people's faith breaks down. And it's simply because, it's not because they don't believe. I think everyone that honestly, genuinely, and sincerely follows after Jesus Christ, they believe in Him. And they believe in the power of God and that He can do things, but when it comes time to reach the hand down and to pull up, that takes a whole other level. Of faith, doesn't it? Because then you're like, what's going to happen if... And what if? Well, the reason that there is the what's going to happen and what if, and I don't know, is because when you believe, when you have faith, one of the first things that comes into your mind is doubt and unbelief. Diacrino and distazo. Greek words that mean to try and make a judgment between two things. Is it right or wrong to do this? Distazo is kind of like do I go to Burger King or Taco Bell? I don't know. I can't decide. Double minded. What should I do? But it's like that with faith. When the disciples were there looking at the man. What if they'd have been like, I don't know if I should stick my hand down there and grab a hold of him. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I know God has told me that I should speak this to this man, but I, 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 you see, when doubt and unbelief come in, faith evaporates. And that great and mighty faith that you had all at once is diminished. And how does that happen? Do we mean for it to happen? No. There is a spiritual warfare going on all around you. There's a spiritual warfare going on right now, not far from this room. The enemy doesn't want you to hear that your faith, when acted upon, is powerful enough to lift up a lame man. Did you know that? That's the, that's the hindrance. That's the hindrance. And the spirit world, the enemy is very good at that. Oh, he, he knows Christians, and he knows just what to say. Oh, you don't want to be embarrassed. I mean, go over in a side room and pray for somebody, but don't, don't try and, you know, do something. You got, you got Peter, John, you got people walking in and out of this gate by the thousands. Are you going to make a fool of yourself here? That's the realm of the underworld, of the realm of darkness, is to sow seeds of confusion and doubt into your mind. They were going to have none of that. And neither should you, and neither should I. If we know that God has spoken to us, if we have prayed in faith, believing that we need to take the next step, and we need to reach out the hand, figuratively speaking, whatever the situation is, you move and you operate as though God has done in faith what you believe that He did. That seems simple, doesn't it? But it's hard. 
Because the enemy comes in to destroy our thought life and to make us doubt and wonder, like, well, did God really say that? Yes, he did. I don't know if the disciples knew this next portion of Scripture when they lifted up this lame man at the gate beautiful. But Isaiah 35, verses 6 through 10, says this. Speaking of when the Spirit of God shall come to his people, then shall the lame man leap as in heart. What did he do? He leaped, the Bible says, and he jumped for joy and entered with them into the temple. And the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. That's what the Spirit of God does. He takes the wilderness, he takes the desert, and he waters it and makes it a fertile place. If you're walking through a desert, understand that the Spirit of God wants to make that desert a place of life, of beauty. You're not alone in the desert. The Spirit of God is ready to pour abundance of water right where you are at. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, a pleasant place to be. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. If you're unclean, if you're not living the life that you say that you're living, then don't be surprised that your faith is so low that nothing ever happens when you pray, nothing ever happens when you try and act upon something. It's because you're not living righteous and holy as God has called you to do. Do that. That's the first step. That's what it's saying here in Isaiah. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Wow. Turmoil. Wild beasts. All kinds of evil surrounding us. Is not evil surrounding us out there? The other night I was heading, I was going to head to, uh, well, it was actually the next night, but the night before where I was going to drive through and go someplace, I read that there was a big demonstration and that the streets were blocked off and this and that. And so the next day I'm driving and I'm like, I wonder if I'm going to encounter that tonight on my way. But if I, and if I do, what will I say? What will I do? So I pray. These days, you better, you better pray about everywhere you go. Amen? You better be prayed up and stayed up. The ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs. There it is again. And everlasting joy upon our heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. My, what a great, great prophecy that became fulfilled by some obedient servants. I wonder what prophecies God has that weren't written in his book but that have been written in his Tablets and have been written in your heart that have not yet been fulfilled. Something for you to ponder. I wonder what prophecies in my life have yet to be fulfilled and how is that going to happen? Lord, show me. Lord, help me. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me power. To do those things, whatever they may be. <clears throat> Acts 3.13 says this. The God of Abraham Hammond, and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, <coughs> have glorified his son Jesus. whom ye delivered up and denied him in 
the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and the Just One and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. I want to close out tonight by asking you, where is your faith? Is your faith just in the infancy state where I believe in Jesus, or is your faith in I believe and I'm going to act upon my faith? You say, well, I don't know if I have that much faith yet, Mark. Well, I can't give it to you. If I could give it to you, somebody else could take it away from you. But if God gives it to you, nobody, nothing, in all of this universe can take it away from you. It's like when I receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Nobody ever can take that away from me. It's impossible. <clears throat> Why? Because I know the Word of God and I know through experience what happened to me. I could hear a thousand people say, well, that's not real, this and that. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, no. Okay, then maybe you need to sit at the feet of Jesus a little bit more and listen to his words. The word faith is used 234 times in the Word of God. You know how many times it is in the Old Testament the word faith? Two. Two times. Deuteronomy. <coughs> that leaves 234 times that the word faith is used in the New Testament. Why is that? Because the author of faith, because the one who sent the comforter who gives the gift of faith, <clears throat> came to this world after the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, what he meant was, sin is finished and my kingdom has only just begun. We've only just begun to see the things that God is going to do. I'm excited. When I see all of this chaos and turmoil going on out in the world, it doesn't make me afraid. It makes me want to go get them. Father says, go get them. Go get them. They're ripe. They're distraught. They're fearful. They're hiding. They're confused. Go get them. My spirit goes before you. Go talk to them. Tell them that I love them. Sad. The first mention of faith is in Matthew by Jesus. Jesus said, If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Is your faith where you know it should be tonight? Or are you like me? I want more faith. And I don't know how much more faith I need to believe because I believe that I believe that I believe that I believe. I've 
experienced miracles. I have seen the miraculous. We've prayed and people have been healed. I, I've experienced the miraculous. But even I need strengthening in my faith. How does that happen? Through the gifting of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts. Faith. Supernatural faith. And that's what we need. If we're going to walk in this world of darkness, we need a, we need a stronger faith. A faith that is pisteo, pistua, that is willing to reach down and grab the hand and start pulling. You see, the moment that you start pulling, God takes over because your faith has met his ideal for what he wants you to do and it will come to pass. How many of you tonight would like your faith to be increased? Hallelujah. God is speaking. God is moving because everybody in here wants to have more faith. That's a wonderful thing. And that tells me that God's Spirit is touching you. I would like for all of you to just lift your hands if you would like the Lord to increase your faith in this house tonight. And we're going to pray. Father, we are a needy people. And Jesus, you know that we need faith. And you know that we need faith that is put to action. We believe in you, Lord Jesus. We believe in what you said. And we know that what you said was right. But the enemy comes in and he casts doubt into our minds. And he makes us think that we cannot do the things that you've told us we can do. And so right now, in your mighty name, Jesus, we bind those spirits that would attempt to convince us that we are not what you have told us and called us to be. And we bind those forces in the name of Jesus. You've given us the authority to do that in this place tonight. And we cast them forth. Do not return unto us, spirit of doubt. Do not return unto me, spirit of confusion and double-mindedness. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you and cast you forth from my mind and my thought life. And now, Holy Spirit, now that we have surrendered and asked for that thing and repented of that thing, which has caused us to have now, Holy Spirit, come and fill us and refresh us with new anointing of faith in this house tonight. Let your power be made manifest in your people. Oh God, you have called us for such a time as this. So that when we go out and we speak and we see the sick and we see those that are distressed in mind, Lord, give us the eyes of faith to see and to reach our hands out and to not just see but to act upon that which you have given us because we believe that you have given us great and wonderful and mighty gifts through the Holy Spirit. So help us. Help us, Lord. We admit that we are frail and feeble in and of ourselves, but your Spirit is mighty and it is able to cut the chains of darkness. It is able to cause your servants to have the ability to touch people and they be healed. To pray with people and their minds be straightened out. To be able to lay hands upon people and cast forth spirits which do not belong there and to give a people rest in their souls. Oh God, give us eyes to see. Fill us afresh. Anoint these people in your house tonight who have asked for more faith, for the kind of faith that says, I will reach down and I will with my strength start to pull upon that problem. And then I will allow you, O oh God, to arise and cause your power to lift.
lift up that situation and to make it right. So thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for moving in the midst of your people tonight.